The Reverend John Huffman is the, board, the chair of the Board of Trustees here at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and he's been associated with the seminary since its very inception. Uh, he plays important roles in that kind of supportive structure of our seminary, but he also is a pastor and has held a few strategic pastorates from Pennsylvania to California. The last six years, he has served us as pastor in residence, coming each semester and spending a week with us and making himself available for students and faculty alike to visit as they need. So it's my privilege to welcome the Reverend John Huffman to our pulpit this morning. Thanks again, Dr. Isaac. Uh, as I share with you this morning, I make two disclaimers. One, this is not a sermon. I have preached here in the last six years. Uh, this will be my 23rd time in front of you as minister in residence. Uh, and the previous 22 have been the opening of God's word and preaching the gospel. Today is what I would say every preacher occasionally has the privilege and responsibility to do, and that is give a kind of state of the world message where he or she addresses an issue or the issues of the day in a way that are, is undergirded by the charismatic, uh, the, uh, the evangel, and uh, the didactic uh, aspect uh, uh, where, where uh, the presuppositions of everything said are pointing to Jesus Christ in evangelism a teaching element and a call to ethical action and behavior uh, from God's Word, but in a way uh, not an exposition of Scripture. And secondly, I want to have a disclaimer, and that is that um, I, if you mention my name to Pope Francis, he would not recognize me. <laughs> in fact, he's made a complaint recently that there are many people traveling the world uh, speaking um, what they think he's saying as and claiming an intimacy with them of whom he has no knowledge. <laughs> and that is always the problem with a person in high profile public life. There are hangers on who claim an intimacy that is not there. On the other hand, uh, during the past year, I have been as close to him on numerous occasions I am to Dr. Stewart here. And uh, uh, would, uh, uh, there are people that travel all the way across the globe just to get a glimpse of him going by uh, on the street in Philadelphia or Washington or New York uh, uh, just to get a glimpse of him. And uh, I have been in environments uh, with intimacy this close on uh, several occasions where he's given addresses and uh, I'll share uh, some of the content of uh, uh, what has gone on in those situations and been very close to some of his very closest advisors in intimate situations with a number of cardinals involving as few as uh, uh, 12 of us at a luncheon together at the North American College, uh, one of them being Cardinal Whirl of uh, Washington, one of his most intimate advisors from the United States here. But the reason I'm sharing with you today is uh, seldom has a personality captured the imagination of the world as Pope Francis has in his brief incumbency as Pope. Much has been said about him. He has uh, created some controversy, uh, some expectations in the press, and I'd like to address all of that. But also, what I'd like to do is talk about the context of how we do ministry and the re reality of the privilege of relating to brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ in the Roman Catholic tradition. And again, I make a clarification here. First, let me say it about our Protestant brothers and sisters. The reality is there are those who call themselves Christian in our Protestant tradition who deny the deity of Christ, the authority of God's word, preach universal salvation if there is such a thing as salvation. I'm not sure a true universalist even understands the notion of salvation, but the okayness of us all which is a religion very different from that of historic faith once delivered to the saints. And so 
we have those in our tradition who deny the cardinal doctrines of the faith. And we also have in our tradition those who have never got around to thinking enough about the doctrines of the faith to clearly understand them and accept them, although they would not deny any of them. But they are the uh, looky-loos that come on Christmas Eve and on Easter. It's part of their tradition, uh, nominal. And I don't mean to put them down. I'm simply there to clarify the fact there will be some, even in the churches you serve, those of you that will be pastors, in the churches out of which you come. And I would say then, in the Roman Catholic situation, you have a very similar situation. You have some that were born into a tradition, and by the notion of their understanding of baptism, simply are Christians, and yet have very little interest in the things of faith, and may even be deniers of some of the doctrines of the faith. Many more that are nominal, and they go occasionally without really engaging themselves, and there are some who really love the Lord. And the context of which I speak this morning is of one who says, I feel much closer to some of my brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic tradition who love Jesus Christ, who worship him. And they may have some add-ons, such as the veneration of Mary and the notion of purgatory and some of these things that we would not hold to in our Protestant tradition, but who really love Jesus. And I have made it a policy of my life since a teenager to every year, at least once, experience a full Roman Catholic Mass because, my friends, the gospel is there. It drips with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And yet I myself could not, on a regular basis, find the edification that I need for my life in what can so easily become a routine of words. But we have in our Protestant tradition certain routines ourselves. But I'd like to uh, do what uh, your homiletics professor will tell you is uh, give a pretext, though, and uh, then depart from that to address the morning. And the pretext is a very important one, and that is from John chapter 17, where Jesus prays for us. Prays for all believers. In John 17, if you open your Bibles, the pew is there to it. Verse 20. Jesus shares this prayer. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that of all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me and that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. The oneness that we have as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So what I've done today is um, put together some observations, first of a background nature of how we, in at least my experience, have functioned as evangelical Christians in relationship to Roman Catholicism, and then some very specifics about Pope Francis. Some close-up observations about Roman Catholicism and Pope Francis. Uh, first, uh, some background. Last November, uh, I was invited to be, um, attend a um, colloquium, an interfaith colloquium on the family that was hosted by the Holy Father in the Vatican, in the room that is not much larger than this room. It holds uh, 250, 275 people. It's where the cardinals meet when they discuss the selection of a new pope. It's where the cardinals meet when they gather from all over the world for uh, their various deliberations, where they met just several weeks ago dealing with the uh, ethics uh, issue and uh, some of the human sexuality issues that are before them. Uh, at each place, there are headphones and uh, um, translation into multiplicity of languages. And there were 235 of us approximately invited from some 35 countries uh, representing all of the world religions to address issues of the family. And uh, a very interesting uh, opportunity uh, to discuss in the broad concept of the various world religions, some of the issues that are on the front page of the paper every day now, 
in terms of the nature of marriage, the nature of the family, the nature of male and female and these issues we're dealing with. And um, we uh, um, had an opportunity uh, because the invitation that I had came from a man by the name of Timothy Bush, who is a Catholic lawyer in Orange County, who when the Christian Cathedral Ministries of Robert Schuller went on the bankruptcy market, 40, uh, 35 acres of land and all of those magnificent buildings, he, uh, the Catholic Archdiocese of Orange County had very much desired to have a cathedral and to purchase land would have been impossible. He saw an opportunity for the Catholic Church to obtain that property and maintain a Christian witness in what otherwise would have gone into a real estate deal and a cathedral, if not being torn down, would have ended up with some kind of a cultural center. And on the bankruptcy market, he arranged for the Archdiocese of Orange County to buy that entire facility for $58 million, which seems like a lot of money to all of us, but yet is very small compared to what a cathedral purchase of land and building a brand new cathedral would be. And in the process, um, he and I, um, in our friendship, uh, have a couple of people that were assisting him in that project, and we developed a, fun, a, a close relationship and friendship, and a relationship with the new Bishop of Orange County, um, Kevin Vaughn, uh, and the invitation came to attend this experience uh, in Rome. And then, um, subsequent to that, when the Pope announced his visit to the United States, which he announced at that conference at the Vatican in Rome, although it was rumored uh, prior to that, but he looked at uh, Cardinal Chaput of uh, Philadelphia and said, I will be with you, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Chaput, and said, I will be with you officially in Philadelphia. Then some add-ons came, a trip to Cuba, uh, a visit to Washington, a visit to New York, and then culminating in the uh, World uh, Congress on the family. And I was invited by my friend to join him uh, in Washington in the papal entourage uh, at the canonization, uh, um, going on up uh, to New York, uh, being at St. Patrick's uh, for the evening uh, prayers, and then the next morning at the United Nations, and then driving on down uh, to Philadelphia for the final part of it. And accompanying us on part of that was Rick Warren, both in Rome uh, last November, and then, uh, and he gave an address at that um, uh, colloquium on the family, and then uh, his address was so well received by Rome that he and Cardinal O'Malley of Boston joined together and team gave the final address at this World Congress on the family in Philadelphia. So impressed uh, was the Roman Catholic leadership in not just describing what the family should be, but practical ways to encourage and enhance that, and you, I'm sure, could get that online if you wanted to do so. A little historical background. I was raised in Boston here, and basically there was quite a uh, separation between Roman Catholics and Protestants in Boston. Our own founder, one of our founders, um, uh, Harold Ockengay, would periodically speak out uh, quite forcefully from the pulpit of Park Street Church, delineating uh, doctrinal differences uh, between those of us who have a high biblical view uh, as evangelicals and certain Roman Catholic doctrines. Uh, there were Catholic tensions and Protestant tensions that I observed. Uh, I noticed, though, when uh, Billy Graham came to Boston in 49 and 50, the then Bishop Cushing told the Catholics they should not attend. That was in 1949 and 50. By the time he came back in 1964, he encouraged Catholics, the then Cardinal Cushing, to attend the uh, meetings of Billy Graham. And there was a collegial relationship built between Dr. Graham and Roman Catholic leadership, not only here in Boston, but throughout the country. Um, I remember when I was in seminary, um, there was the calling of the Vatican Council uh, by uh, Pope uh, John the 23rd. And then, um, again, the warming of relationship with Billy Graham and Cardinal Cushing to the point that Harold Ockengay found this site for a seminary, found out that there were very few novitiates in the Carmelite order here, about 20, but Ockengay was not favorably viewed by Cushing because of some of the things he had said through the years and even issues over should a Catholic be president of the United States during the election of 1960, uh, but Akinge uh, had softened in, uh, in many ways uh, relationally in these things, 
and he got his colleague Billy Graham to go and see Cardinal Cushing. And uh, the Cardinal was quite surprised when he heard how few novitiates there were, and he agreed to sell this land to uh, Dr. Graham and Dr. Ockengay. And I reminded uh, Cardinal O'Malley when I talked with him uh, a few weeks ago, and he laughed. He said, oh, I know what's going on at Gordon Conwell. That's a fine seminary. And uh, he knew about uh, uh, the roots and the history of, of this land here. And um, then in 1975, I was invited with about 20 other Protestant evangelicals to spend um, 15 days in the Vatican. They had discovered that there were in the United States representatives of Protestantism that were not as uh, well represented by the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches as they had thought in the past, and with whom they were discovering a closer identity in some ways. And for, uh, I was at the time a pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, I had become quite a close friend of Cardinal John Wright, and uh, he helped in this invitation, and they hosted us in, uh, at the Vatican. Every morning, meeting with a different cardinal, a member of the Curia, who headed up a different department. Now, if you go to Washington, you'll see uh, where the, sec the, the, the uh, uh, headquarters of the State Department. You'll see the Treasury Office. You'll, well, in the Vatican, those buildings you see, those are headquarters of various aspects of what is a, a country uh, that has nuncios going to all the countries of the world, ambassadors representing, choosing who the bishops will be in those countries, and also um, uh, carrying on education and theology and many, many departments. And we met with the heads each morning of those departments, each one being a cardinal. And in the afternoon, we met with the heads of the Holy Order. Remember one afternoon meeting with Pedro Rupi, who was then the head of the Jesuit Order, and expressing my evangelical, he said, well, you know, that's the way I started out my priesthood. And I went to Japan. They told us you had to learn the culture and earn the right to be heard. And I've often thought, how many hundred years do we have to be there to really then speak up and be heard? And he was very warm spirited. We had wonderful conversations. We went to some of the uh, Subiaco to the cave of St. Benedict and up to uh, Assisi. And uh, it, was, it was just a marvelous experience. Uh, for me. And uh, prior to that, when pastoring in Key Biscayne, Florida, uh, I had an open line talk show on the uh, uh, public broadcasting with a rabbi, priest, and myself. And for about a year, the priest, Father Donald F. X. Conley, who was a priest from Watertown, who for years had been uh, with NBC in New York, uh, resourcing all of the Catholics that appeared on the Today Show, had gone down to Miami with Cardinal Carroll. We found it was so awkward, we kept deferring to the uh, rabbi saying, now you do not believe in Christ, Jesus Christ, but we do. We found out we had a real oneness in Jesus Christ, and finally we went to the leadership of the TV station and said, would you give us our own show and give him one of his own? Because we're spending too much time being gracious to each other and not enough time being able to be specific in terms of the phone-in questions that were asked with theological and personal nature. And so I saw a warmth and a brotherhood in this wonderful uh, Catholic priest who loved Jesus every bit as much as I did. And I learned much from him, and I think maybe he may have learned some things from me. As we see the years go by, we see uh, the Pope that was there when I was uh, there uh, was Pope Paul VI. And then, of course, the election of uh, uh, later on of Pope John Paul II. Many people do not know how close Billy Graham was to him. John Akers, Billy Graham's uh, um, uh, very close companion in anything Billy did in uh, ecumenical work and in the, in the uh, behind the Iron Curtain at that point, describes an occasion when, uh, in I believe, 1996, Dr. Graham seldom traveled anywhere without a male companion, just to protect from any kind of innuendo or question or any framing up a friend of his in evangelism. Someone had planted a woman in his hotel room and he went there and the photographers were there and it was a frame up and Billy did not want anything of that sort. But on this one occasion, he'd been vacationing with his wife Ruth in Switzerland and was coming down for three days of meeting at the Vatican with the Pope. And uh, so he traveled alone, but John Akers flew directly to Rome to meet him. It was at the train station and the train disembarked and there's no Billy. And he was beside himself. What in the world happened? 
And he waited and waited till everyone had left. There was no one to be seen until way down the platform he saw an old man sort of stumbling along. And he realized it was Billy. And at that time, it was not known that Billy had Parkinson's disease. But he had misplaced his medication and was disoriented. And he said, the man I met on the platform could not have spent one hour with the Pope, much less three days. I took him to the hotel, opened his suitcase. There was his toilet kit. There was his medication right there. Gave him uh, uh, his pill, his L-dopamine and, and uh, uh, dopamine, and he was uh, snapped to. What no one knew at that point was that the Pope also had Parkinson's. So it was an interesting dynamic. But that's the kind of closeness. And, uh, and I could go on uh, talking about these kinds of things uh, of uh, the evangelical movement, uh, Chuck Colson with Father John uh, 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 Richard um, Newhouse and uh, collaborative things have been done with Protestants and Catholics in this period of time and of course then we had um, the election of Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Now I told you how I was, happened to be invited to Rome and um, the, um, the meeting on the family uh, I've told you a little bit about that already um, and uh, the experience in Washington but let me uh, uh, tied in with uh, the experience at Rome were these wonderful luncheons uh, with uh, my friend being very close to the leadership uh, in the Vatican. Uh, there'd be um, five cardinals. We'd go out to lunch together. And uh, his, it was his 60th birthday party and at the North American College where they trained the future leadership of American uh, Catholicism. Uh, there was this intimate luncheon for about 12 of us. and. Uh, uh, about eight of them or nine of them were cardinals, including uh, Cardinal Whirl from Washington, who had just come from being all morning with the Pope in terms of working on the uh, one-year study on uh, these ethical matters and was going back to be with him yet that afternoon. Uh, it was that kind of intimacy and same thing uh, in the trip to Washington. My friend hosted a dinner for all of the bishops in the United States and cardinals. It was very interesting. Uh, the security lines, for example, the canonization, it took my friend and myself an hour and a half to go through security, and then we sat for two and a half hours in the hot sun. And, uh, but the bishops all came in by bus. They stayed at a Marriott out by uh, Reagan Airport, and uh, there were about 250 of them, and there were these five or six buses. They went through the security there, and then they became a, a security zone uh, with a police escort, and they got to the, the um, um, uh, American College um, um, uh, in, in Washington, uh, where the event was held, uh, didn't have to go through the security the way we did. And that evening, because he was hosting a dinner for all of them, uh, we were part of the police escort <laughs> back to the hotel. And to see the bishop and so forth change into street clothes and so forth and have dinner, it was interesting to see a more informal side of, of these persons who are the leaders of the Catholic Church in the United States. Well, um, at, uh, we had a dinner after um, being at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York uh, with the head of Opus Dei. There were about six of us at dinner there. And the next morning, uh, his driver picked him up at about a quarter of six to go and have a private meeting with the Pope. I was not invited to that. And then after the, he came back and took me to the UN to go through security. And I was seated in the front row of the balcony of the UN with the man who was a primary writer of the, the Pope's speech while he was sitting with Bill Gates and others down in the VIP section uh, with the Cardinal that was the supervisor of, and, and the, the Pope gave something like 18 addresses. And you gotta realize uh, there are speech writers and helpers. Uh, he didn't have to sit and write every one of those himself, but some of them are highly specialized, uh, the US Congress, uh, the UN, uh, but all the way along the line was doing the mass. And uh, I sat through a number of masses that he led and. Uh, and the gospel was so clear, and his homily was so Christ-centered, it was uh, very special to observe. Now, in conclusion, let me mention six observations about Pope Francis. These are my observations. This is not the gospel. And uh, I may be incorrect in some of these, but at this point in time, these are my observations. One, he's a communicative genius. He's a great communicator. Different from Billy Graham in that he's not physically imposing. And it's not the striking nature of his physique 
and uh, articulation uh, ideologically, um, but he is a person that has the common touch. And he's able to spot a child or see a widow or observe something in the crowd or as he moves from place to place and there's a magnetism that comes out perhaps of his Latin background that has not been as much of the, uh, uh, that of a more Germanic type pope like his predecessor. And uh, there is a conveyance, they said that um, at the uh, canonization of Father Sarah, uh, there were four times the number of press present than there were when Pope Benedict had come to the United States uh, uh, several years before. Uh, he gave 18 messages, as I mentioned, uh, but uh, what we look for uh, was his touch with the crowds as they came from all over the United States, in some cases from all over the world. Second observation, my personal evaluation is that this man is not a liberal, theologically or ethically. The press is trying to make him out to be that. They have stated expectations of him. They have quoted a statement that he said, who am I to judge? But any faithful pastor would say, who am I to judge? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us needs God's grace. And how we elevate one sin above another, I think uh, perhaps the Roman Catholic tradition has done that more than the Protestant tradition has done that in terms of theology. But the fact is, a pastor calls all people to repentance and to trust in Jesus Christ. And God forbid if I ever said, I'm the one to judge. And I'm sure any of your faculty members would not want to be the ones to judge. And to make a statement like that in the context of many other statements and to come to the conclusion that that's an endorsement of a action, not an orientation, but an action, um, has yet to be realized in other statements as he's made. I think the press has been surprised that he's not been uh, uh, lived up to some of the expectations they've had. And this morning's New York Times turned on him with quite a strong uh, article decrying his failure to speak out against homo uh, speak out in favor of homosexuality on his trip to uh, Africa. And he clearly uh, did not. And they said that he lost an opportunity, he should have, and you can look it up uh, on the New York Times today as they were decrying um, his failure to do that. But I say that reveals something very clear to have gone to Uganda and addressed many other of the world issues without stepping into uh, making a statement of endorsement in that area. What he said on capitalism, I have some friends that say that man shouldn't speak about things uh, uh, that of a business nature. He was articulating the encyclical of um, Benedict uh, that came out several years ago dealing with the issues of the marketplace and Christianity in the marketplace that decried dialectical materialism as it stripped from people their dignity and their possessions. On the other hand, saying that capitalism without any kinds of controls can end up very quickly with greed and a separation of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And it's the kind of thing I hope you're studying in ethics here at Gordon-Conwell. And he himself said, when he said that, he was only quoting, quote, Benedict, who many are trying to put him in juxtaposition to Pope Benedict. Uh, I do not see him as a liberal. I have not seen him change anything in the way of doctrine. I asked um, uh, Bishop Vian, uh, telling him how he's going to speak here. I said, can I say that? He said, you certainly can. To this point, he has changed nothing. That's the Bishop of Orange County, who I checked this out with, and who I will give a copy of my address today to. And uh, I'll let you know if he has any, uh, but I, I basically cleared most of this in terms of, of understanding here. Uh, no major changes yet. He might surprise us. He's a human being. Uh, but uh, the reality is that's my observation. Third. He presides over a very complex, huge bureaucracy. Let that sink in. The Roman Catholic Church is in practically every country in the world. 
The Roman Catholic Church has some people within it, even in positions of leadership, who have been involved in sexual abuse. And we're very aware of that. It has persons in it that have uh, theological deviations from even what its own church teaches. And you have all of the differences of uh, uh, racial, all the differences in terms of background and expressions uh, there that you have in worldwide Protestantism. And uh, he is the titular head of it all. In fact, uh, it's very interesting. We, my friend and I heard a statement coming from someone at the Vatican saying that as much as they decry the fact that uh, uh, Pope Benedict lived in the papal quarters and uh, laud him for not living in the papal quarters, it was Pope Benedict that suggested he not live in the papal quarters because he had become isolated from the real world in that and that he followed through on his recommendation. A very interesting side observation. No major changes yet. He presides over a huge complex bureaucracy. A fourth of the six, I'm just about done here. He oversees doctrinal diversity and stylistic dynamics of everything we have in Protestantism with the exception of extreme liberalism. Hans Kuhn would be censored by the Pope as he was for expressions that would be moderate in terms of the real left wing of Protestant theological expression. Would not concur with our thoughts here at Gordon-Conwell, but uh, he has uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, presides over um, uh, a enormous uh, doctrinal diversity uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, expressions of uh, five in particular. Traditional Catholicism, where the person wants the Mass in the Latin. Uh, this evangelical renewal, many more now are asking for a biblical message from their priest and, 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 and Mass in the vernacular. You have the charismatic renewal movement within the Catholic Church. You have the worker-priest movement that had Christian Marxist roots, not atheism Marxism, but uh, some of the thought, and even that was reined in by the previous uh, second to last pope. And uh, also, um, what I say, uh, uh, moderate to more liberal theological thought. And you have the institutions, hospitals, you have universities, and all the diversity you have uh, in these institutions. Uh, and he uh, oversees uh, this enormous diversity. And, and in the bureaucracy, uh, not only is a banking system, there are secrecy issues, uh, confidentiality, all of these things make his job more complex. Fine, the last two here. Seldom does he speak ex cathedra. In fact, he has not. Seldom does the Pope speak that way. We as Protestants assume that, you know, we've heard about uh, speaking ex cathedra, and self a service, so whenever the Pope speaks, that's the final truth. Uh, Google that, look it up, it, it seldom happens it, that um, S. Cathedral was established in uh, 1870, uh, dealing with, I believe, uh, Mary's uh, ascension into heaven, uh, something of that sort, dealing with Mary, but seldom is that used. And that's one of our concerns, though, as Protestants, that we are, our, our truth is uh, based on scripture, uh, not on tradition, and no one person has a right to speak in that way. And finally, uh, he cannot be detached from his predecessors. I have friends who say, oh, I love this pope, and I don't like the last pope. And this is when I ran in front of Bishop uh, Kevin Van. I said, here's my theory. There could not be a Pope Francis if there was not a Pope John Paul II and a Pope Benedict. He said, tell me more of that. I said, my perception is that John Paul II, a Polish pope, had the intimacy of understanding of dialectic materialism and rang the changes worldwide, showing the flaws of that. It was no small factor in the decline and demise of uh, the Soviet Empire and uh, Marxism, both in China and in the Western world. And then along comes Pope Benedict, who's a theologian. And one thing theologians do is speak with precision. Theologians are the gatekeepers. They are here at Gordon-Conwell. Harold Ockengay was more of a theologian than a Billy Graham. A Billy Graham was expansive, 
welcoming evangelist. Harold Ockengay could say, but yet there's this question or that question. And that's what Pope Benedict did. In fact, John Paul had him as the one who was the gatekeeper theologically on the morals and doctrinal teaching of the church. The fact he was German, the fact that his name was Ratzinger, sounded a lot like Rottweiler, and so he picked up that nickname. But the fact was he's a gatekeeper. And he then became pope, and he chose the Cardinal uh, Lovata to be his gatekeeper, a, a good friend of mine, and uh, uh, one that uh, 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 there is that enforcement. And then, of course, you have uh, a pastor, uh, a pastor from South America, uh, with the welcoming dimension that a pastor has. There is a difference between, in just the very nature of how you're wired, your thought process between a pastor and a first-rate theologian. And both are essential to the kingdom. So I conclude. Um, yes, uh, I will grant there are differences between evangelical Christians and Roman Catholicism. At the same time, I feel much closer to my brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church who love Jesus, have repented of sin, who put their trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation than I do to some of my Protestant so-called brothers and sisters who deny the great doctrines of the faith and basically are working against their wonderful ethical humanists. But there's a big difference between that and historic Christianity. My friends, this is not the word of the Lord. <laughs> my friends, this is a word from your pastor in residence endeavoring to help us perhaps uh, look at some things from perspectives that we otherwise would not see them. And God bless you. I love you all and appreciate the privilege of being invested in this institution since 1969 where a theologian and an evangelist, a great communicator, an embracer, and one who was able to delineate Christian truth with specificity on whom the evangelist relied as his gatekeeper, founded this institution. And thank God for all of us that make this thing happen to the glory of Jesus Christ, and let us be one in the Spirit and one in the Lord with all who profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, for whom Jesus prayed that prayer. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.